So welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders, and thinkers. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Rob Montgomery. Rob, you're very welcome to the podcast. Let's begin by asking you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your setup um, and share with the audience what you do and what you're involved in. Sure, yeah. My name's uh, Rob Montgomery. I'm an American, uh, but a full-time resident of Berlin for 10 years. Uh, The way I got here is by marriage. Uh, I'm a journalist, a former editor of Chicago Tribune, worked at the Chicago Sun-Times as a page one editor. So I've worked in news and features uh, in the first uh, part of my career. And about 2005, uh, I left that newsroom to go into consulting and to teaching. And I've worked with media development programs uh, and ever since, you know, starting made 17 trips to Egypt and uh, taught thousands of, of Egyptian journalists how to do visual journalism, photojournalism, video journalism, multimedia journalism. And it all was barreling down to the point when, um, well, this thing came out. And this thing came out right the day before I flew to one of those conferences in Egypt where I was meeting editors in chief. And what I'm holding in my hand here is iPhone one. Uh, for those of you not watching the video, this is iPhone one. I'm always amazed. My, my students are always amazed that when I touch it, it turns on, <laughs> that it actually still works. Um, and that you could play doodle jump with it, for example. Um, that's about all you can do with it. It won't even connect to the app store. Um, so, so that's one of the things that's been as, as this, this career that I just did on a lark, um, you know, doing, a, I redesigned a newspaper in San Francisco called the San Francisco Examiner. Uh, I redesigned one in Africa called Leadership. You know, I was doing newspaper design and graphics at the time. That was my earlier reputation. Um, but I was always in love with visual storytelling. And so I've been blessed um, to kind of find my own way. I guess it's now been 17 years um, doing this as a self-employed uh, journalism instructor, which I have to say is something that is supported here in the EU and uh, particularly in Germany. So, you know, journalism instructors are valued as a cultural <laughs> asset. Uh, and so that that allows you some opportunities that, you know, I just certainly would not have had uh, if I had remained in the U.S. So uh, pretty much whenever I got on a, on a plane, it's an international flight. Every flight I have is international. Um, I train journalists in more than 30 countries in mobile journalism, in digital skills, in innovation methods. And I love that fit. Oftentimes I'll be combining those using design thinking and innovation um, techniques to work with journalists in, and try to get them to work in cross-functional teams to explore maybe new ways of using video storytelling, you know, bringing ideas of public power journalism into their vocabulary so that they're thinking about when they're thinking about social media, when they're thinking about video, when they're thinking about developing new ways to serve their communities, that they're involving the people in those communities much earlier in the process. And so that's been a, something here 17 years later, I could have never have predicted at the beginning of this journey. As you mentioned, I am in a a, a television studio. I've got light and sound here. Um, This was something that uh, I, I, where I teach from pretty much uh, most days when I'm in Berlin and I'm not on the road. Um, I'm currently teaching 125 broadcast reporters for the Middle East Broadcast Network based in Washington, but they actually have reporters based in 12 countries around the world. Yesterday, I did an online session, uh, the first session with a new group uh, everywhere from uh, North Africa to Eastern Europe to Chicago. Um, they've got correspondents everywhere. And so we were doing it here in this little uh, TV studio, teaching them these techniques. Um, and this is what my work from home looks like. So this is when I'm staring down the barrel when I'm doing uh, a Zoom like that. Uh, I've got the ability to do live switching without having to share my screen. So it keeps things fluid. Uh, and it keeps things really easy. So if I want to then switch over to whatever, you know, we're editing a story here on my iPad, or better yet, if I need to switch to a camera view where you can see what control I'm touching, I can do basically live television here with animated graphics that fly in. Let's say I don't want that logo. I want my smart film school logo. I've programmed all this right here. So it's right in front of me. And I guess the inspiration for that might have been kind of, do you remember the old Jim Cramer financial wizard kind of TV show where he had this control board where he had a bunch of buttons and he could just 
you know, make sound effects. Well, basically, this is that <laughs> kind of that idea, uh, except that I've got actually, you know, uh, uh, macros here that are contracted to a MIDI uh, nano control uh, piece of hardware uh, that talks to an ATEM switcher. It's all low cost DIY MacGyver type stuff that during the pandemic, I was able to kind of geek out on and put together in a way to serve my audiences. So this is um, the Smart Film School, which um, does serve, you know, for journalism uh, schools, serves media outlets and serves NGOs and media development um, uh, training opportunities. So it's something that started maybe eight years ago. Uh, and now it's, you know, it's it's really going gangbusters, um, getting uh, a lot of interest in, in, in journalists getting these types of skills under their belt uh, and making the most of, uh, you know, that ultimate reporter's notebook uh, that we all carry around with us in our pocket and kind of unlocking the power uh, of it. And, and what's funny is that's exactly what I did when I got this. The next day I flew to Egypt. I'm holding the iPhone one again. And I, I was the first person to walk into the whole country and I had one and I walked on, I had this gig to be on stage and talk and I changed my topic, I changed my lecture and I pulled this out of my pocket and said, this is the most powerful notebook ever, ever you know, reporters notebook ever created. And we can't wait to see what we're going to do with it. And all publishers and broadcasters, all they were thinking about, well, that's just a great channel. That's just a great screen for us to put our existing kind. We're just going to port what we do there. And my approach was always from the beginning is no, no, no. This is this is a super, super tool for for reporting and documenting nonfiction storytelling. So that's where I live in this world. Uh, and that's what I'm about. And that's what I'm passionate about. I love to make films. I love to make short films. I love to edit on my iPhone. Uh, and and kind of wow people. I feel like I'm a little bit of my childhood dream where I could be a magician. I was never a, a good magician as a child, but somehow I figured it out here later in life. I hope that's enough of an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rob, I, th I think that's phenomenal. I mean, from the, you know, the heady newsrooms of the Chicago Sun-Times, you know, and that journalism sort of beat, if you like, as, a, as an editor, uh, news editor, and it is uh, incredible to think where we've come and you've been you've been showing us the 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 very first iPhone that Steve Jobs announced on stage and he didn't have buttons and it was a piece of glass and everybody was blown away by it and i think of the development now in lenses and audio quality and processing power of yeah. smart devices today including the latest iPhones of course and um, it truly is it's a powerhouse in in the pocket of a journalist now isn't it and you referred to it there i think as the, the the journalist notebook now is that what you said you called it i said it's well so as journalists we always carry around you know we always got yeah. a pencil or a notebook in a back pocket you know yeah. it's it just that's a tool of the trade it never it's analog it never goes out of style um this i'm holding up iphone 1 um is the most powerful no you know reporter's notebook ever invented because it was connected to the internet because you could work with text. The, it had a camera, but it was absolutely the worst camera in the world. I mean, here I'm now holding iPhone 13 Pro Max to the lens, and now I've got three cam, four cameras. There's the one here that's the, the side, you know, self-facing camera. It's got four cameras. It can shoot ever since the 2006 or the I'm sorry, the 6s Plus. Uh, been able to shoot 4K video on, you know, unbelievable. Um, and that we can edit and share in real time. We can broadcast live without a satellite truck. I mean, these things were just, you know, forget about it. Uh, iPhone one just gave us the internet, the ability to write and read, maybe take a picture, but definitely view videos and, you know, and make notes of what's happening in real time. It's just gotten better. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned the old satellite truck there. And I was going to say in sort of a seven year curve of experience going through that, um, you've seen an awful lot of change when it comes to journalism, the term mobile journalism. We've seen, haven't we, a rise in citizen journalism too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've seen newspapers impacted by the, the, the digital change, I suppose. We've seen some big publishers come and go. Uh, but one thing that hasn't changed, and I want to get your insights on this, is the, the art of storytelling. Yeah. So that's kind of where that's kind of my home area. That's where I uh, that's where I find evergreen uh, examples and work is because what I do is like it's really easy to be wowed by 
all of the uh, the marketing, you know, megapixels and and gigabytes. But at the end of the day, viewers don't care about that. Audiences don't care about that. They care about, are you telling me something that's worth listening to, watching, reading? Uh, is it going to help me solve problems in my daily life? Is it going to entertain me? Is it going to inform me? Is it going to make my life better, my kid's life better, my community better? And the better you can, stories you can tell, the better you're able to be successful in all those areas. So uh, basically what I found is that if I teach what I call text-oriented reporters or text-oriented writers, how to report, how to first, you know, document in pictures, report in pictures, and then write with those pictures, then they can more easily write to those pictures. And that is a complete inversion of the way that they think stories are made, edited, and told. But it is the filmmaker's way. Uh, and it's a really, it's the pure photojournalistic, the pure documentary uh, way. You, you, you don't have a story until your camera finds it. You may have an idea, you may have a thesis, but you don't know it until you've documented it. So taking them through on that journey um, is quite an experience, especially when you're dealing with seasoned reporters, you know, international uh, correspondents that I train, people who are very, very skilled. They're already standing on the top of the mountain of their profession. And uh, and they've come to you because they want to get to the top of the mountain that I'm on. And I have to tell them, look, there's no cable car. There's no Zyobon that will take you. To... <laughs> you have to be willing to climb down and climb up with me um, and be willing to, 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 to have all the pain and suffering that goes with it because there's no shortcut. And the ones that do uh, are just uh, make amazing stuff. They, 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 they find that there's so much creativity um, when you make storytelling your focus. And you unlock the power of that phone or any mobile camera. I, I, the, 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 those lessons are translatable. So whatever I teach you on today's mobile phone will work with your GoPro, will work with an Insta360, will work with a bigger camera or a crew. You know, it's a language, in other words. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that insight, Rob. And obviously, you I mean, you mentioned your documentaries earlier, too, and I know you've won awards in um, Hollywood and of course Berlin and Moscow and places like that and I know that you chair the mobile journalism awards but when it comes to broadcast quality which is what I was going to ask you about um, the technology has changed so much uh, you know you don't need the satellite truck anymore to go live uh, but then the you know the journalists on the ground they're also recording in real time uh, and they're telling a story in real time, or they're having to put a package together to send back. And how does that work in a, a mobile journalist world today? You know, when you're talking about broadcast production. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting. It's a great. And, and the answer just keeps getting better and better because there are just more ways that this tool can get plugged into your existing workflows. They can support uh, when you're able to go out with the crew um, they can support what you're able to do when you're doing lives. They can support what you're doing when you, you're doing uh, documentaries, particularly um, going into areas where big cameras draw a lot of attention, draw a lot of security uh, awareness. Um, so it's really a stealth weapon at some or weapon or tool, you know, a way to, to, to attack um, elements that, that just aren't possible with larger gear. Um, so that's why I get excited too, because you know lately I've been working with producers for current affairs shows, like in Singapore. I mean, these are people that are at seriously the top of the mountain. You know, they do four stories a year. They do four hours of television a year. So think about the quality of that story that they're doing, and 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 now they're interested in how this device might fit into some projects that they're doing. Um, it's quite exciting because that just never happened before. Um, you got a lot of pushback from camera operators saying, are you trying to replace what we're doing? No, this can't do telephoto work. This can't do a lot of stuff that, that a dedicated camera can do. Uh, but it can also do things that are hard or all, nearly impossible <clears throat> for a dumb camera to do. Yeah. So the key is to, to be smart, to learn the capabilities. And that's why the training is really important because you learn where the edges are. Uh, you learn, you know, you learn where your fingers get burned and you learn where your fingers are happy, you know, making the music. So um, you start to become more intelligent about how you integrate it into your workflows. And that's why it's important not just to train reporters, but to train their editors as well. 
and you're working with journalists from some of the biggest news corporations news agencies in the world whether it's Reuters or Channel News Asia or you know there's lots of them that you that you work with across the world are you having to as you were saying earlier almost reteach the way that they go about a story then or are you you know no, 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 that they're smart enough. They're seasoned enough. Um, so a lot of times it's coaching. A lot of times it's maybe consulting with them on particular types of gear or, or training for certain teams uh, for documentaries or, or for uh, features or for lives. Um, no, I think they're just much more open to it now because, I mean, people can see that the quality of the pictures of the videos has gotten better. They, they're curious about the apps. They're curious about the tools. And I tell them, look, you look at the work that I've done 90% of the time, I'm not using anything but the phone. And the times that I am is because it's, it needs to be there to solve a specific problem, you know, uh, or a specific uh, type of shot or a moment or an interview that I'm doing. I need it. Um, but anymore, I really don't need much more than the phone. Um, now, when you're doing stuff where there's a lot of uh, interviews or you're doing a lot of piece to camera work, you definitely need the microphone set up. But there's so many. What I tend to collect more often not over in my in my Mojo uh, equipment locker, which is just off 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 screen there, uh, is microphones because that remains the most powerful. You're using a nice high quality microphone. I'm using a radio microphone here in my studio. It's just out of the shot. I framed it out. Um, but if I but if I if I bring it up in the screen, you can see it there. Um, because it, it, it look what we're doing now is the most intimate form of media. I'm literally in your ear or I'm in your car with you, or I'm, you know, I couldn't be closer. So having great sound for podcasts, that's what drives the story and great sound drives great films and great video stories as well. So you really cannot, there's no real shortcut <laughs> to great sound. Absolutely. Yeah, audio is 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 key to uh, to good video, right? It's kind of really important. Um, yeah. And what what about when these journalists are on location and they're shooting video? What about mobile lighting? Because we talked a little bit about audio there, but you know, you think of you think of a a camera crew, the truck, the lights, the you know. But from a mobile journalism point of view, how do you get around that kind of stuff? Is it just the latest tech innovations, or well? Um, so a lot of it is, is technique. It's, it's being aware, it's being sensitive to light and the effects of light to know the different kind of, and, and to have the experience shooting in different lighting conditions. That's like a lot of what I train, uh, especially in the first sessions is where is the light from? How strong is it? You know, so the direction, the strength, the quality, the color, these all affect, you know, and basically if you are doing interviews or you are filming people, you need to have that light on your subject. So sometimes it can be as simple as if you've got an assistant and they can reflect some light back, you know, positioning people, making sure the light is always touching your sunshine on your shoulders, what I like to say, um, using window light to affect. In other words, kind of using available light the way a photojournalist would. Very intelligent, very aware of light. When I was, when I talk with my, my good friend at the Sun-Times, who's a Pulitzer Prize winner, his name's John H. White, about this, he's like, he was like, listen, Rob, I feel light. I can feel it. I'm walking down the street. The light changes. The sun goes behind a cloud. I adjust my camera. I just reach down and, and it's an instinct. And I think his awareness kind of informs me in the way I teach it. It's like, I want you to feel light. I want you to know that it, it's just as important as sound. Um, and there are times when you're going to have to um, maybe use a little LED lamp or a lot of LED <laughs> lamps like I've got here. Because if you look at my background there, that's not a green screen. This is actually light. I've got three cheap DJ lights behind me. I've got a remote control here somewhere. Yes, maybe here. I could change the colors of those lights. Um, so that means my background is very, very bright. So if I didn't have also four LED soft boxes in lighting me up, I would be, it would be dark. I would be almost yeah. a silhouette. So whenever you point a camera at a bright source, it's going to silhouette something in yeah. the foreground. And that's, so that would mean that's backlit. So to counterbalance that in my studio, I've had to add an, an impressive amount of, 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 of little lights here. Yeah. <laughs> just, 
So it's important because when I need to show you something, I can come right up to the light. And I know that this, this, this thing. Soft boxes are bringing it up. Yeah. Yeah. So soft light, diffuse light, finding it in the field can be difficult. So sometimes it's it's looking for skylights, open, what we call open shade. Maybe light is being filtered through the leaves of the trees. It's being broken up somehow. Yeah. That tends to soften. It has kind of that diffusion effect. So being aware of some, some little things like that, but ultimately these things, all go by the wayside, these production quality things, when the story is super important, when you have it right in front of you uh, and there's an audience for it. So <laughs> at the end of the day, um, you know, timeliness and, and newsworthiness out Trump. Uh, it's production. A, yeah, it's a balance, right? It's a decision, I suppose, in real time. So what I've done is I've just ran over to my mojo locker and I've grabbed a one liter bag here. Yeah. Uh, and so this is all you need. This is a mojo kit. So in here, I pull out a couple little devices. One is a, a grip that you attach your phone to that also lets you attach light and or microphone to. So that's, and then to any photographic equipment. So a little mini tripod, for example. Um, here's an example of a small microphone that would go right onto that rig and plug right in through the adap adapters here, right into the phone. And it's got a little a gray fuzzy cover on it which helps pr uh, protect from the wind noise but maybe all you've got is your phone or you're doing podcasts um and this is kind of like what uh neil augenstein who's a wtop reporter in washington dc this is all he carries with him and his phone and because it's made for like a, a little small recording device a zoom recording device you can actually just slip your phone in there and voila now you've got a little windproof uh audio recorder uh for a radio reporter so it's it's bringing out your little macgyver here's a little light by the way a little rechargeable light that just goes again because of that we've solved the problem by connecting you know using a, what's called a cold shoe which is like would you a, a flash or a microphone would attach to that grip now i've got something here where i can just pop up and just illuminate my victim i mean my subject yeah, so all that fits into a little bag, and that's pretty much all you need. Um, your little go kit. Um, beyond that, you can you know you can do wireless mics, radio mics. Uh, you can do two mic setups, uh, split track audio. You can have tripods. You can have gimbals. You can you can, you can go lights out into the into much more film production, but still keep everything light and nimble. And it's important because people, when I talk with these reporters like yesterday. They're like, you know, whenever I go and, I'm, and I've got a shy subject, somebody who's really afraid, when we come in with the crew, they're, they're, they, we can almost never get them sometimes to talk. But when we use our phone, it's familiar, it's friendly, it's non-threatening. And so that is also a secret weapon to unlock um, when you're working with um, sensitive subjects or, or subjects who are really camera shy. That, hey, just whip out your phone. It's you know, People are used to that. They're not used to a big, you know monster camera being in with all of the lights and the, the microphones and sticking off of it you know shoved in their face it's intimidating good you know? point it's a good point yeah, yeah. well thanks for well, sharing that, that insight yeah, there's all these little tricks you can do yeah uh, and, uh, with, the, with and the, the lighting and working with the light i love the comment yeah. you said though Rob, about your friend at the uh, chicago sun times i think that he can feel the light he can feel it changing and it's oh, a natural man. response just to change the camera well, John is a remarkable human being. I mean, he's 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 very sensitive, very 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 very. Um, he's as he should be, you know. He he's invisible, so that he can get great pictures, you know. And and he he his his journalism is just pr profound. Uh, so if you ever have a chance to look up John H. White and the work that he's done at the Chicago Sun Times, hero of mine. I bet you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> just put, just remember that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was going to ask you just one final thing on the on the the uh, the work that you do with journalists around the world, whether it's you know whether you're sort of instructing journalists for the United Nations or whether you're working with Reuters or whether you're working with Chicago Sun Times or whatever agency or news um, association that it is, is there a common sort of thread that they come to you with? There's just a common problems that they're coming to you with in today. Or is it really, can you just help me level up, like you were saying? Or do you see the same organizations having the same challenges? Or is everybody different? 
no, they're all the same. They're they're all the same. They're just doing it in different places, um, and they're maybe at different points on that spectrum of of, of pain and uh, or problems that they're trying to solve. You know, one of the things about working in, in, in a Pulitzer Prize winning newsroom like the Tribune or the Sun Times and working every day with the editors and the editor being the right hand person of the editor in chief to put that vision of the best news on page one every day uh, is, is that it's an incredibly addictive. <laughs> environment you are surrounded by you go into a room where everyone is a nerd you know and there's just so much knowledge and so much energy in a newsroom and uh, that was the thing i missed immediately when i went into to to freelancing and so i think the reason i'm drawn into all to work with any of these newsrooms anywhere in the world is that i want that i need to walk into that place and have that feeling again um and it's it never it has never left you uh, it's never left me also. Um, but the thing is, um, sometimes it's just, they, they sometimes like anyone, you just want to comfort, you just want to know it's okay. Yeah. It's okay to use your phone. <laughs> here's how, yeah. If yeah. you're going to use your phone, here's how, because here's what you can do with it. And so that's why I like to, you know, switch over and show them, look, I'm not talking about other people's work. I'm not like some lecturer who's just now suddenly an instant expert on mobile journalism. Like you said, I've made hundreds of these films. I'm showing them right now in LumaFusion, which is my favorite video editor at the moment. And I'm showing them, you want to do a story about a place? You want to do an explainer story? You want to do a personality profile? You want to do a story that was that had no planning? Here, I, let's go ice swimming in Helsinki. This is a story that was reported over about four days, completely improv, spontaneous in the moment, could not have been done any other way. And it won all those prizes that you were talking about, ice swimming. And it's one minute and I don't know how long, maybe one minute and 23 seconds long. So that, I mean, film is a reductionist medium. So um, it took a lot to get it. It's not it's just like it took them one minute, 23 to make. It's like, you know, it, it's a distillation medium. And that's why I find it so fun. And that's why I try to get journalists excited about it. It's like, your stuff that you do on your smartphone is good enough for the silver screen. If you follow the stuff that I've learned, if you, if you follow these kind of principles. Um, so that's why my lecture is usually called from smartphone to silver screen. Well, that's, that's excellent. And I know as, as well as the newsrooms, you spent some time in Paris, in France as a, as a visiting professor. Yeah, I state. did. <laughs> I did. I do that a lot. I was just sh showing you some graphics there of like all the elements in a news story. So like when I'm teaching uh, at EFJ in Paris, um, which is, uh, I can't even say it in, in France, but it's basically the school of new journalism. Uh, and I work with Jacques. Uh, oh, sorry. I keep going away to the wrong picture here. Um, I probably do need a technical director uh, pushing all these buttons rather than me. Um, it's a lot of fun because I'm going every time he calls me in. I'm working with a different class. Sometimes I'm working with first year. Sometimes I'm working with second year um, students. And basically, it's 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 a three year program. In their third year, they're already interning. Okay, so these are people who um, they've already had their school and they're getting their journalism training. So uh, when I'm working with them, I've I've had them uh, come with me to a conference in Italy at the International Journalism Festival. And I was kind of like working as the editor in chief. I say, I need two person teams. I need you to come up with story ideas. I need you to come up with a social uh, video uh, concept, How, which platform, what's your name, what's your branding going to be, and who you're going to cover. And each day, uh, make a plan. And then at the end of the day, we review it. And in between, they they go to the conference and they, they, and they interviewed like the head of France television. They were getting all this amazing stuff, running around with their phones. And one group, one, one group was doing Instagram stories, another was doing YouTube, another was doing, you know, and at the end of the day, this was this phenomenal portfolio that you could have when you had, I called them ninjas, 12 Mojo Ninjas students covering an international multi-day event. Um, and so sometimes that's my classroom. And that's what's really fun with mobile journalism. Is the classroom is the field. The stories are not in the newsroom. As much as I love to be in the newsroom, that's just not where the stories are. They're out there. So get out there with real people, um, document nonfiction with your phone best you can and learn how to tell those stories. So I'll do that uh, also with with them in in innovation projects. So we would start a client says, okay, we're 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 a magazine. 
uh, and we want to do a food uh, video uh, segment and we want to have something that engages. What are your thoughts? Well, I'll lead. Uh, thank you. And then I'll send that person on. And then for the next few days, I'll work with the students and lead them through the innovation methods process to develop ideas, understand the audience, develop prototypes, and then pitch it to that client at the end of the week. They'll come back and these students have now got a three minute pitch that's right on target and a prototype sample clip to show them. Um, and they get like five, six pitches because I'll, I'll team students up and they're just blown away. So working with those students is particularly fun. Um, it seems like the only times I get to go to Paris is when I'm working. One day, one day I'll go there with my wife for fun. Yeah, but you'll probably make a, a short documentary while you're there. I mean, yeah, I hear you. Those days are, I just don't have the energy. Usually that's how all my documentaries are pretty much done on, on, on the off hours. I happen to be in Moscow or I happen to be in Helsinki doing something else, doing training. And then by way of doing that, I come out with a story, something that, that, that becomes a documentary. Yeah. So yeah. that everything is unplanned in my world when it comes to the stories. Cause I just, my camera is curious. And so I just let my camera find stories. I don't, I don't try to force it. My camera is curious. There's a great name for a book. <laughs> I love that. The curious camera, I think is what I'll call the book. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Um, so look, thanks for sharing all that. That's been, that's been a wonderful journey and people hopefully getting more of an understanding of the, the work that you're in and the world that you work in. And it, it's fantastic to bring it, you know, whether it's the students, the newsrooms, the, you know, the, the journalism sort of traditional right up to the modern mobile journalism that you're teaching today with leading organizations around the world. When you learn yourself, when you take on board information yourself, are you reading books? Are you studying the internet? Is it just trial and error? Are you an audio book kind of guy? How does that work for you in your world? Yeah, I'm a visual learner. I mean, I'm, I'm an autodidact. I, I was a terrible student in, in traditional classroom based um, environments. I was always seen as underperforming <laughs> would be the kind way. Um, just because I was our, but when I got to university, um, I tested well <laughs> in the, in the, in the, in the aptitude test, I tested well. Um, uh, so when I got to university, it would also be the same thing. I would go to maybe the first couple classes and, and the last one, and it somehow still passed the test. And, and, and the people would look at me, what's, what is your deal? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I tend to process information in, 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 in a multimedia way. Um, so that's pretty much, that's why I tell stories in a multimedia way. Yeah. Okay. I can write. I, I, I can write. I can write. I've, I've written two books, um, and uh, on on these topics, um, I don't read uh, fiction. I can't. I find that the the, the doing this level of nonfiction story has ruined me for fiction reading because I see all the plot. I see all the holes in the story. I uh, I see the duet machina. I see, I see problems, <laughs> and so it's not enjoyable. It's interesting you've done that because I've spoke to a few filmmakers. And, you know, the, the problem is when they're trying to enjoy a movie, they're, they're actually focused on the angles and the lighting. <laughs> well, I'd have done it slightly different and it, you know. Yeah, I, I promised my students that I'm going to ruin that that evening's Netflix viewing with their partner because they're suddenly going to be sitting on the couch calling out all the shots that I told, taught them earlier in the day and how the director and how that is the vocabulary and grammar that is used in everything you watch. You just didn't know it, you know. Uh, and now you know what it is. <laughs> and I apologize for that in advance. Um, now, but... having the other question I want to ask you, Rob, is having worked with people at the top of their game in the news world, or, you know, Pulitzer Prize winners, et cetera. Um, when you look back over your career journey, there must be people that you that you've admired along the way, whether it was Steve Jobs holding up that iPhone that you were holding up yes. earlier, or whether it's people at the top of their game in the in the news world. But when you when I ask you that question, who who immediately springs to mind for you in terms of people that you admire or that have inspired you along the way? Oh, that's pre that's pretty easy. It would actually be Tom Schultz. Of uh, I don't know if you know who he is. Uh, he is literally like what I'm doing here, one man band. He wrote all the songs for Boston. He wrote the lyrics. He wrote the music. He played all, nearly all the instruments, and he was the recording engineer, producer, and arranger. Those kind of people are um, have always inspired me. Is it the is it the multi 
aspect to what you do is there a certain control element in there or is it just being able to create within that environment no 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 don't get me wrong i love to be in a band too i love to collaborate um but like when i recorded my album 20 years ago lullabies and little ditties it's been on itunes for 20 years um i went through that same thing i i wrote all the songs i played most of the instruments but i i got my friend who plays drums to play i got my cousin who knows keyboards to help me arrange um but pretty much i did all the recording and editing and mixing and and singing of course as well um and i just I, it's just i the love of the experience it has nothing to do with control it's like that's the only way i could do it first usually that's the way it is it's the only way i can get it done is if i do everything that's usually what happens um, which means I have to like take on all of the burden of of knowing and being wearing all those different hats and having the discipline. Uh, but I love figuring it out. It's just it's a puzzle. It's not control. It's more like that's an interesting, challenging puzzle. I want to figure out how to do that. Yeah, I got it. So it, it's almost a cryptic making... thing you've got to solve, right? And yeah, it's like that's hard. So it, it, things that are complex and difficult interest me filmmaking eluded me for until the last 15 years because i ne i was never trained i i i i, I deconstructed it and reconstructed it in my way to understand it so that i can teach it and using journalism and and the experiences i have as, as a reporter and editor um allows me to then train journalists how to do it it's like it's very simple as a photojournalist that was my first job stringing for the ap as a student I, your job as a photojournalist is more like a hunter. You know, you are trying to get the picture. You're trying to get that picture that gets on the front page of the newspaper or gets in the newspaper at all. You know, so you're 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 all honed. Your instincts are to get the moment. You know, that that one moment that captures everything. Whereas when you're doing films, you have to be much more like a chef. I need a little bit of this. I need a little bit of that. And then I bring it into the kitchen and I make my dish. I kind of have to be much more of a gatherer than a hunter. And that's a complete different brain brain flip. Your, yeah. your mindset, your whole approach to the environment, your whole approach to reporting changes. And do you feel, because you, you were podcasting before the iPhone even came out, before it was even an, an idea. You're one of the very early podcasters, or whether it was releasing your own album and playing the instruments, et cetera, and your friend on drums, or whether it was, you know, uh, working on page one uh, of the, the publications going out. Has all that sort of, do you, do you feel that over the 17 years now, all that is sort of overlapped into this crescendo of expertise that you have, and it's all helped along the way? Or do you find the mobile journalism is a particular niche that just needs a particular focus? And it's it's a little bit different. Yeah. So it was interesting. It, it all it all kind of blends. <laughs> it all it all seems like the same animal to me. Uh, maybe I'm just looking at different parts of the animal or, or the inside versus the outside. Uh, they all seem to be related and that's been that was when i started to map because i like to do mind mapping and if you've if you've never done mind mapping i found it to be a great really uh adventurous exercise for your mind um because once i i did this and i started to work with um uh, howard finberg at the pointer institute he was visiting here in berlin and i said i got an idea this was before i'd written my first book i've got an idea for my book and i started to mind map all these different things that were around multimedia journalism which eventually became uh, mobile journalism and, and concentrated. But I just found that this exploring all these intersections where these things like you had talked about were hitting, just just were kind of mapping out a, a cosmos that that seemed really interesting. <laughs> and I think we're just beginning, really. Yeah, that's exciting. And so obviously the other question then, we've talked about, you know, people that, that have inspired you. You mentioned... Um, people that have inspired you but what about advice because you've obviously picked up advice along the way I'm sure plenty of people offer advice and you of course now to spend a lot of time giving advice so is there any advice that stayed with you whether it's from your childhood or from your, your career your working career to date or is there any advice that you find yourself really keen to share with others that you could share with us today uh Bob? yeah sure um well, I think Walt Disney said it best, right? Just keep moving forward. And, and it sounds really basic and simple, but it actually is kind of evergreen. Uh, I, I think the advice that I got is just never be satisfied. That doesn't mean to be unhappy. That just means to never don't be so content with, with things. Um, uh, so the advice that I can't attribute to, I guess I just, it's a advice I've observed by people's behaviors. The people who just, 
are comfortable in chaos or being comfortable and being made uncomfortable because they have to then get out of that. Those type of people inspire me. And those, uh, that's the advice I took was just observational. Yeah. So keep moving forward, obviously. Um, And then there's that sort of, you know, never, never sort of rest, never be totally satisfied. You keep be, be inquisitive, always be looking at solving that puzzle. Right. And, and, uh, yeah, I like that a lot. So thanks for sharing that. Sure. And um, at the time of recording this, uh, we kind of got a, a new year ahead of us. And when you look forward, uh, what are you going to be focused on in the next year? Like what's on your to-do list? What are you thinking about at the moment? Uh, for me, um, it's pretty much kind of a tour i think i can already tell you just in the first weeks here i'm getting a lot of interest in 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 the training that i'm doing so i know i'm going to be in italy in april i'm going to be in las vegas right before that at the at the bea show um i think there's going to be a lot more travel it's going to be kind of a return to form uh before 2020 yeah, it sounds, it sounds, let me do that again. It sounds like um, there's an awful lot of more uh, flight, those international flights <laughs> getting out yeah. and uh, meeting people and sharing advice and wisdom along the way. Yeah. Um, now, you've got a couple of books that you've written. Um, there's an album out there somewhere that people can there, check it's out. Still there. It's still there. Um, but if people want to find out where you know where to find your stuff, how to get in touch with you, maybe online, if they if there's something in the, particularly in this mobile journalism and this broadcast video production world, where's the best? Where are you sending people to these days, Rob? Uh, well, of course, my blog is the easiest way. Uh, just remember, it's Rob with two B's. I'm surprised you didn't ask about that. So it's R O B B Montgomery. Dot com and that's kind of the gateway uh, if you're interested in the training that i do th- that's all organized on the platform i built called the smart film school so smartfilmschool.com uh will let you kind of look at that and from there you can find what you need if you're looking on youtube uh go to the mojo trek hashtag that's one word mojo mobile journalism trek which is like the german for hiking uh, and you will see that I married an insanely crazy uh, but beautifully uh, uh, adventurous German lady. And she drags me around to volcanoes at the bottom of the world. And I say, I'll go, but I'm going to film it. Um, so you will see adventures there uh, on the YouTube that I then turn into tutorials and, and teachable um, films. Because if you can do that with small gear, um, where everything's under pressure, then you can certainly do it when things aren't. So that's where that's where kind of the intersection goes with Mojo Trek, uh, leading to the Smart Film School. So that that's a great uh, that people want to find out there the great places you can go to to find out all about Rob Montgomery with two Bs. You have to finish the story, Rob. Well, see, I, I dropped it out there. So what what what's with the second B, Rob? That's what you should have asked, right? Um, so okay. One is you could say my middle name is Bruce, so that's where it comes from. Uh, Or you could say, well, Montgomery's Scottish, right? So you're Robbie Burns, you're Robbie, right? You're a Robbie. Robbie was what I was when I was a kid. My wife calls me Robbie now, so it's just short for Robbie. But actually, that's what my dad uh, called me. So I'm actually Robert Bruce Montgomery II. So, and there you go. So look, look up Rob with two Bs Montgomery. Follow him on all the links. We'll add them down below as usual. And uh, it's it look that's a lovely lovely place to wrap up this episode with Rob Montgomery on the global discussion. So thanks to Rob, thanks to everybody who's watching or listening to this podcast. Make sure you like, follow, subscribe, do all the usual things that you do with the podcast. We certainly appreciate it. And I would love for you to come back and to watch or listen to more episodes of the global discussion, where once again we'll be talking to more creatives, leaders, and thinkers. Thank you, Rob. It's been a pleasure to talk Thank to you. you. Cheers. I'm going to fade to black now.